So hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Dominic Brabant. I am Deputy Director here at ZE. And I welcome you today on behalf of Ulrich Pfisterer, who is, I guess most of you know, Director and also Head of the Research Project on Paul Petot. Um, he's unfortunately unable to be here today due to a lecture trip to China. And I have also to excuse Mrs. Maria Effinger from Heidelberg University Library, who is also involved in this project and who is also unable to attend today. This evening is dedicated to Paul Petrot, a councillor of the Parliament of Paris, a collector of book of antiquities and medieval coins. More specifically, this evening is dedicated to the launch of a research project which started in, I think, September 23, if I'm right. Um, it's called I Desire Nothing But Ancient Things, Paul Petrot, Ancient Culture, National Identity and Religious Devotion. The first printed illustrated catalog of a private collection of antiquities, a comprehensive digital study. And the digital reminds you of why um, uh, it is a project in collaboration with uh, Heidelberg University Library, as I guess most of you know, um, Maria Effinger is very, um, very active in this area. It is a project that is located here at Central Institute, but it's, all, it's financed by Fritz Thyssen Foundation. And the research staff is, uh, of course, Ulrich Pfisterer as um, the head of the research project, Christina Ruggiero and Elena Vajani, um, who are here today and who will speak in some minutes. Um, the project is um, one that is methodologically um, uh, ranging from diverse fields. There is basic research like tracing objects, for example. There are questions of taxonomies of knowledge. What kind of knowledge in, is based in the collection? How is it structured? It's based on questions of object biographies, the reception of antiquities, theories of collecting, and last but not least on questions of visual studies and visual culture. And I'm not going to say more about it because Cristina Ruggiero and Elena Vajani will talk about it in a minute. Um, and, and that is, I think, very important for the outreach to the scientific community and the interested public. It's an endeavor in digitalization of um, what is left by Paul Petro. Uh, we are therefore looking forward today to the presentation of the project. Um, and to the subsequent lecture by Rosa Maria Rodriguez Porto, um, who is here today and who will speak after the other the research staff has presented the project. Um, let me very shortly introduce our first two speakers, Cristina Ruggiero and Elena Vajan. Cristina Ruggiero has completed her studies in art history, German literature, and Byzantine art at the uh, Albert Ludwig University in Freiburg in Breisgau. She graduated in art history with a PhD on Roman Baroque funerary monuments. Her research and publications deal with European networking and collecting in 17th and 18th centuries, particularly between Italy and Germany, the reception of antiquities and drawings and prints, as well as with early photographic documentations. She has published uh, some books or publications on Filippo Juvara, uh, the Capricci and architectural drawings based on the study of Roman antiquities. And she has also been a long time uh, working as a research assistant at Bibliotheca Herziana in Rome, but also at LMU Munich and uh, as primary investigator in a DFG funded project on the reception of Hadrian's villa in 17th and 18th centuries. Mm -hmm. Elena Vajani is a former researcher of the Scuola Normale Superiore, where she has studied since the beginning of her academic training. She graduated in the history of archaeology and um, has a PhD uh, in the history of art criticism, which was supervised by Salvatore Settis and uh, Paola Barocchi. The main topics of her research are collections of antiquities and antiquarianism in the modern age in Europe, and the history of archaeology with a special focus on numismatics, gems, and small objects. 
She has collaborated with the Instituto per gli Studi Filosofici in Naples for a book um, on La Correspondance de Nicolas Claude Fabri de Perez avec Lelio Pasqualini et avec son neveu Pompeo. Um, and also she has published two catalogues in collaboration with the Royal Collection, Windsor Castle, on the Paper Museum of Cassiano Dal Pozzo. So we're looking forward now to your presentations. Thank you very much and wish you all a nice and interesting evening. Thank you very much, Brabant, um, for your kind introduction. So I start with the presentation. The two years project founded by the Thyssen Stiftung aims to study and publish in an open access annotated edition the first printed illustrated catalogue of a private collection of antiquities and coins by the Parisian councillor Paul Petot, a study never addressed so far. Crucial for the success of the undertaking are the institutional environment of the Zentral Institut für Kunstgeschichte, which hosts the project, providing ideal studying condition, and the digital infrastructure made available by the Universitätsbibliothek Heidelberg with the Hide icon, the Heidelberg Object and Multimedia Database, the Annotation and Commenting Module Hi Anno, the Open Access eBook Platform, Art Historical Net, .net Art Books, for the interactively linkable publication, and last but not least, a website which has just gone, li gone live. So you will find, uh, and you see a screenshot of the page here, you will find general information at the moment, but not yet links to the database that uh, uh, we are implementing. But before I start, I want to thank Ulrich Fister and Maria Effinger for supporting practically, practically, technically, and personally the, this project from the, from the beginning, and my friend and colleague Elena Vajani for accepting, accepting to embark on this challenge together with me, both in writing the application now in implementing the work. Thanks are also due to Rosa Maria Rodriguez Porto for agreeing to present some of her research findings this evening and to engage in scientific discussion. Petot's publication consists of two parts. The Antiquaria Superlectilis Portiuncula, a selection of artifacts pertaining the antiquity, and the Veterum Numoro Norisma, Prince of Roman and Early Medieval Coins. The volumes bear the date 1610. This is the year of publication of the first edition that turned out not to be one and steady, but for which there are several versions. Contextually, 1610 was also a very significant year for France due to the political and religious events that involved the country, to which I will return briefly later. So it must be assumed a programmatic choice of the date by Petot, since the volumes were not completed at that moment, but they still represented a kind of work in progress. For the bot volumes, we have been able to trace so far groups of printed books of the first edition. For the moment, we have come to 58 uh, versions or 58 books uh, uh, with groups um, of uh, versions, uh, differing both in the quantity of and sequence of plates, which are not numbered, and in the inconsistent addition of Paul Petot portrait. And there is also one, one version, one example with uh, a different kind of binding. I mean, not on the long side, but on the short one. Thereafter, plates were added between 1611 and 1618, while the date on the frontispiece has not been updated or extended. I remember that Paul Petot himself died 1614. Among them, among these added plates, there are one, the right, uh, one plate, the right one, added at some point, uh, illustrating the Sucellus with a proposal for the integration of a missing forearm. A poem for Petot that also plays with anagrams of his name with the year 1611. This is an exemplar or um, a version uh, kept uh, um, at the Biblioteca Angelica in Rome. And uh, this uh, side, this, 
plate or this uh, sheet comes on the black on the back on the verso of the portrait if the portrait is available. Then there is a plate with the date or the year 1612. With, uh, uh, which uh, documentates recent findings from archaeological excavation docu documenting a burial complex with two skeletons and funerary objects. Then there is an altar dedicated to Mercury and Rosmerta, which seems to have been found 1615 in Langres. And uh, there is a new portrait of Peto, the one on the right side, um, by Isaac Priot, which replaces the previous one by a not better identified François Rousset from 1609. So there is a kind of growing of this catalog or, or the first part, but of both at the end. And here is a kind of reception of these two initial portraits. I will come back later to this point. This year, 1618, the year of the second the new portrait, may be of great significance because exactly at this date, the sale of Petot collection on behalf of the widow began, and thus it can be assumed that the portrait, the new portrait, has been um, enhanced for this purpose in a more appealing arrangement. The first reception of Petot's catalogues can be found in Albert Henri de Salangre, a Dutch historian who included Petot's books in his publication Novus Thesaurus Antiquitatum Romanorum, published in Den Haag uh, between 1716 and 19 in three volumes and reprinted in 1735. Starting from a copy of the Portuncola, the first of the two catalogues, with Rousset's portrait, portrait from 1609, he had the plates redone by the Dutch engraver Franz van Bleiswijk, who assembled on one sheet four plates from Petot's catalogues. Then between 1719 and 24, Bernard de Bonfoucault mentioned Petot's occasionally in his L'Antiquité Expliquée. 1757 followed an updated and expanded edition with both volumes, even if we don't know who the Spiritus Rectors rector was, certainly someone who had come into possession of the copper plates. A portrait of Paul Petot, taken from those by Briot from 1618, opens the volume, followed by a list identifying the antiquities, but not the coins. In this edition, a pagination of the plates has been added. We have antiquities, which can be found on 22 plates, portrait and frontispiece included, numbered from one through 22. This is the number on the um, upper right edge. Uh, while the coins start from the plate 23, frontispiece included, and this number is maintained through the, the, 20, through the plates and is followed by a letter from A to X. Finally, four more plates, um, with, antiquity, uh, with antiquities numbered 24 through 27. Even if neglected from a certain point, Petot's publication is extremely important in several respects and can be rightly considered a missing link in the history of collecting because it is not only the first illustrated catalog because it is not only the first illustrated catalogue of a private collection of antiquities, but it is also a forerunner of many of today's better known and more regarded colleagues in the way Petot diversifies the way of representing objects. And furthermore, the publication is a political manifesto, as we could reconstruct the year 1610 had for Petot and France a great significance. But what were Petot's motivations for collecting antiquities and publishing the catalogue of his museum? To whom was it addressed? What is, was it only a matter of curiosity? And what was the source of his interest in medieval coins, almost unprecedented in the culture of his time? The hypothesis proposed here is that studying the past for Petot meant going back to the origin of the unity between political and religious power a unity that was severely compromised at the time of Petot. 1610 is the year listed as that of the publication, where the recurring phrase on the frontispiece, non nisi prisca peto, I desire nothing but ancient things, is beside an erudite motto, more importantly, a programmatic political statement. 1610 
was the year when the King of France, Henry IV, was stabbed to death in the streets of Paris. Petot was one of the councillors of the Parliament of Paris, the appellate court, which had to take important steps to manage the political crisis caused by the assassination of the king. And always Petot was about to publish his books. And this is not, so we think, a mere chronological coincidence. Elena will provide you with more evidence later. I will now briefly focus on the first volume of Antiquities, describing some of its features. After that, Elena will deal with the second volume with medi medieval coins and introduce Petot's library. Rosa will finally present an in-depth case study related to a manuscript owned by Petot and now preserved in Copenhagen. So we hope to give you an overview on this figure and on his interests. Under the categories of objects labeled as Antiquare Superlectilis Portuncola, a selection from what appears to have been a larger collection, basically one finds so-called supellex. Besides statuettes, there are oil lamps, vases, inscriptions, objects of the material culture, worship objects, gravestones, archaeological finds, Roman, Egyptian or Egyptianizing, medieval or modern objects, which are heterogeneous, also in the material they were made with. We are not yet able to name with certainty the draftsman or the engraver, but most probably he was the François Rousset who has engraved the portrait and which signature can also be found at the bottom of a Gnorisma plate. Gnorisma is the second volume. However, we can point out various kinds of representations while, as you may have noticed, the catalog are devoid of any comment commentary. So we have a single plate, uh, excuse me, a single ob object on a plate, which can be represented in a following plate from another viewpoint, as in the case of the Sucellus of, of this satya. We have multi views of the same object on the plate, as in the case of this Ushepti or this Isis lactans, but also of these brushes. Plates, with the same kind of objects on the left, the oil lamps, or assemblage, assemblages of different objects, artifacts. And we have the documentation of an excavation, which is quite um, modern and unusual. Related to the composition of the plates, when it is the case, the copper plates are were mounted on the same sheet. Also two in this case, we have several examples with um, at least two, uh, copper plates. The plates in the first edition are not numbered, as I said, but have at least one inscription at the higher and one at the lower margin. Sometimes there is also a third one in the center. The first names the typology of the object represented and the material, while the one at the bottom informs about the location within Petot collection or cabinet. So we could identify so far a bookcase, a labeled cupboard, chest of drawer, a picture gallery, there is also the word museum, what it may have uh, meant with this, we do not know exactly, but I show you two um, images of two uh, similar cabinet uh, of curiosities, the one taken from the Historia Naturale of Ferrante Imperato from the end of the 15th, 16th century, and the other one from the Museum of Francesco Calzolari in Verona, 1622. Both were Museum of Natural Histories, History, but it is interesting to see that inside the cabinet there were not only animals or plants, but also in the um, shelves there are uh, gems or coins, there are uh, bases, there are small antiquities, and importantly, important, there are also books that are stored and displayed there. Um, other letterings on the plates reproduce inscriptions featured on the artifacts. Among them, there is, for instance, the transcription of an excerpt from a letter here on the left, or the inscription on this knife on the right. And finally, the, the, the commentary of, or the documentation of, on these excavation findings that I have already shown. Some plates carry also a date, uh, as in these three examples. Uh, um, indicating the year when the um, artifacts were founded, found, for instance, 169 here, 1612 there. And on the third one, we have uh, another kind of um, information 
69, the, the, it seemed to be the year when this sheet was published. Um, we will see what it mean, could mean. <laughs> um, a little bit of suspense. To our work. Uh, at first, we try to retrace the objects represented, which generally have turned out not to be masterpieces of art, but they seem to possess ideological value or otherwise to have stimulated Petot's in antiquarian and collecting interests. Among them, there are, for instance, the knife of Saint Louis, Saint Louis, which is an important medieval relic. The letter mentioned above, which was written by Suger, abbot of Saint Denis or the medieval medal portraying Giuliano Marasca, none other than a work of the Peduan medalist Hermes Flavio de Bonis, alias Lisippo, Lisippus the Younger, or a gravestone which later passed in the Calus collection. Uh, it still exists, but unfortunately we do not yet have the picture. It is in, in Paris in the BNF. Or the figure of this satyr, mother with a baby, with a child, a baby satyr, uh, which is in the Louvre. And interesting, not only this one, but also some other artifacts that not, have not been recognized by the museum as um, deriving or from the Petos collection. So this is also maybe a contribution we could give to this uh, aspect. In other case, we will probably never be able to identify exactly the artifacts belonging to Peto, given to the frequency with which the object were produced. Such mass-produced artifacts are, for instance, the signacula, the seals, or the brushes. Sometimes oil lamps and objects of material culture, which are difficult to be identified with precision. It should be not it should be not forgotten that some of them must also have been lost over time or damaged. Interestingly, there is a group of 19 artifacts that made us suspicious. The majority of the antiquities represented among them belonged to none other than Pirro Ligorio, which had, these objects had great visual success were co and were copied, for instance, in the Codex Ursinianus, now at the Vatican Library, uh, which was an undertaking promoted by Onofro Pambino, but were copied also by Duperac, Peiresque, Ministrier, and please note, all French artists, and of course by Cassiano dal Pozzo. Because of uh, the, uh, here I show these three um, canopic uh, jars, but uh, because of the close proximity to the Ligorio drawings, we have long puzzled over the source from which Peto could have copied them. I just show you one example, and this is this Libra. Um, uh, we have Ligorio in the upper left side, on the upper left, and Peto. Um, the bottom, and we see that the scale is uh, represented while uh, Duperac and Cassiano, or the copist who work for Cassiano, have omitted this detail. So we have some questions. There is no evidence that Petot has been in Italy, so what did happen? We came up with the idea that Petot probably had copies from Ligorio's drawings, and that what he represents in the catalog are exactly the drawings in his possession featuring antique artifacts. The inscriptions on the lower margin might support our hypothesis, exhibited, so displayed, or published. This is also the case with the Suger's letter, a copy of which was bounded in one of the manuscripts of Petot Library, so he shows the copy of the letter in his possession. For other artifacts, there are still some notes and doubts to be untied, as in the case of two seals depicted in a French manuscript, as well with copies from Ligorio and the Codex Ursinianus. The seals, as we can, re as we can read in the inscription, belong to Pierre-Antoine Rasca de Baguerry, an advocate at the Parliament of Aix-en-Provence, one of the most notable antiquaries of his time, and a figure very close to Henry, uh, King Henry IV, who appointed him intendant of the king's medals and antiques. Further, um, Baguerry uh, trained Peiresque in the connoisseurship of antiquities, coins, and medals. And so this is an interesting case. Uh, we have not to solve this <laughs> Uh, enigma, because we have this uh, French manuscript with the two seals. Uh, the two seals were represented in Petot's uh, catalogue, 
it is written that they belong to Bagheri and we have found them, traced them in the BNF. But as on this plate in Petos Portuncola, there is no inscription on the bottom about the display of the seas as usual in the other plates. So further research will be needed to understand what this is all about. So if you have an idea, it is welcome. However, one thing, one thing seems clear to us. The cycle of befriended advisors gravitating around the French court included big names, Petot, Bagheri, or Peiresque, and Elena will mention some others. There is indeed a lot of material related to Peiresque, who was in fact charged to estimate Petot's coins. I show a detail from the antiquities, while Elena will do some more in-depth work with respect to coins. Petot represents a bidimensional Ludus Latuncolorum, a two-player strategy board game played throughout the Roman Empire, which is said to resemble chess. Petot indicating the material on the inscription, and um, of which Petot, uh, of which Peiresque, excuse me, took the care to draw the individual figures with their respective name and denominations. So here is, again, um, this means he worked, Peiresque worked on this material, um, on, the, uh, on the artifacts uh, that belong to uh, Petot. So these uh, show us a very tight connection between the two, at least the two. I would like to show you even more examples, but time constraints force me to stop. I will conclude by reminding that all information concerning the artifacts and their graphic reproduction are fed into and stored in a pool in the Hide Icon database. From here, this information can be linked in the facsimile digital editions of the catalog, which features an interactive, interactive and dynamically expandable commentary apparatus. Finally, the results of a study day will flow into an open access publication where in addition to Petot's first biography, we will contextualize Petot's work and its relevance for the history of collection. Thank you for your attention and I give the floor to my colleague, Elena Vajani. Uh, so thank you very much, Christina. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the Central Institute for ho hosting this project and for this presentation too. Uh, I would like to thank Ulrich Fisterer for the chance to write this application and his su suggestions, Maria Effinger for a great support and their experience, and of course, Christina Ruggiero for a great support and friendship and for making this work easy and enjoyable other than interesting. And this does not happen so so often, so thank you, Christina. And I will introduce Petot's catalog of coins like he did with the frontispiece of the Gnorisma, which has an architectural frame in the shape of a temple's facade. There are vases from the Piero Ligorio tradition, a sort of link with the other volume, as Christina has shown. There are coins and mottos. All these ornaments suggest to stop a while with a sort of reverence, I use the word the words of Mark Fumaroli, before crossing the threshold and entering a new book. And in a book with no commentary, it is the frontispiece which introduces what would follow. The coin at the top has on the obverse the image of a Mars Ultor, Mars the Avenger, on the reverse, military standards. Petos' comment, running along the tympanum of the temple, is Arege Henrico haud multum hec abludit imago. This image is not much unlike King Harry's. That is to say, it is similar to King Henry IV. The connection between Mars and the king is not a simple homage by a learned man. As we know by poems and writings of the time, it is a connection which has its reason in the month of Henry's conception, Mars. He was born in December and which played a major role in the king's propaganda. 
the king himself commissioned in 1600 a gallery in Fontainebleau, which was decorated with paintings, including a portrait with the king as Mars seated on a military trophy. The paintings are lost, but you see this one in Po on the left, attributed to Jacob Bunel, and dated to 1616-01, uh, and it's believed to be in close connection with the Fontainebleau one. Henry, sorry, Henry is also depicted, sorry again, okay, as Mars in some medals. This one at the Louvre shows a fight between Mars and the Centaur, an allegory of Henry's victory on the Duke of Savoy, whose symbol is the center, the, the zodiac sign of Sagittarius. On another medal uh, by Guillaume Dupré, uh, the king is represented as Mars and his wife Maria de' Medici as Athena, with the Dauphin Louis XIII. Still in the 1620s, a painting never realized by Pieter Poor Rubens. We have an oil sketch here. Uh, the first of a gallery in the Palais de Luxembourg dedicated to Henri IV by his wife Maria should have represented again the birth of Henri of Navarre at Po. Here, the god Mars, as you see, with trophies and standards presented the newborn prince with a flaming sword. So Petot's book, and this second book in particular, must be read keeping in mind the time he was living, the wars led by Henry, the expectations aroused by his reign, and also, as Christina has said, his tragic murder in 1610. This is confirmed by the coin at the bottom, which represents three heads, the three Gauls, three Roman provinces in, Fran in France that supported the Emperor Gal Galba, who was killed in 16, in, uh, sorry, in, uh, by his rival Otho at the time of the civil wars in the Roman Empire. Through this coin, it is not hard to link the civil wars of the Roman Empire with the wars in France, civil and religious wars in France during the reign of Henry IV. Just a quick note, also the Mars Ultor type was probably struck during the Roman civil wars. But at this point of the research, I'm not able to say if Peto was aware of this, as it might seem from the context. I like the coin of Galba, whose inter interpretation is straightforward. There is uh, the, the emperor on it, so it, it, quite, it is quite easy. The Mars type was probably harder to place chronologically. And in the 17th century, it is included among the Republican coins. So the king, the monarchy, the civil wars, France. The frontispiece announces something absolutely unexpected. Unlike any other book of numismatics, the Gnorisma is not a catalog of Roman imperial or Republican coins, but a catalog of pre-Roman Gallic coins, Merovingian, Carolingian coins, with only a few pieces from the Roman Empire, mainly struck in Gallia. In other words, it is an illustration of the French national past. And as far as I know, uh, these are the very first images of French Gallic and early medieval coins to have ever been printed. Although Petou is the first to publish a work like this, his interest in ancient French coin is far from being isolated. As Corrado Vivanti has shown, the election of Henry IV led many scholars to work on the history of France with the idea to support the political action with historical research in order to restore the royal institutions and the religious peace by then obscured by years of war. This way, many politicians and historians studied French medieval manuscripts, collected antiquities, and also collected French coins. As we can see from a manuscript in The Hague by Nicolas Fabri de Peresque, rich in notes, description, sketches of early medieval coins. Many collectors are cited in Peresque's pages. Among them are also Petot, as you see in the page on the right, and Pascal Lecoq, whose coins Peto has represented in two tables of the Gnorisma. 
On one hand, then, a printed work on French coins is something exceptional and probably would not have been of the greatest of the greatest interest among the Republic de Lettres. We must remember that Petot book, Petot's book is self-published. There's no text, there's no dedication. On the other hand, the coins were highly appreciated by Petot's contemporaries and by his circle of friends, as shown by the fate of Petot's collection of coins, which now we have been able to trace. As Christina has said, in 1618, only the Gallic and medieval coins, that is to say the coins represented in this book, were acquired by the Bishop of Lisieux, Guillaume Duvert, and valued by the Saint Peresque. And it was Peresque who had uh, the coins by Duvert after his death. Peresque collection of antiquities was bought by Achille de Harley and the coins of Achille de Harley in 1674 were bought by the King of France, Louis XIV. This way, the coins formerly belonging to Petot entered what is now the Cabinet de Médaille, and we have then the chance to recognize them, probably going a bit further than we expected when we wrote the application. For example, some Merovingian gold coins can be identified with a good degree of certainty since they are quite rare and known in a reduced number of replicas thanks to documents, Paris papers, Petos images, and 18th century catalogs. We see on the left, this is a, this is a late 17th century catalog which mentions the gold coins of France uh, comparing the uh, inventory entries with Petot's images and the coins uh, in uh, the Cabinet de Médailles, we are uh, able to recognize the uh, exemplars belonging to Petot. This is a very particular coin be because it is from Orléans, which is uh, the birthplace of Petot, and he included this coin uh, in his portrait. These other coins we have identified with the help of Peresque notes, again, Petot's images and the coins uh, in the Cabinet de Médaille. If we compare Petot's images to the actual pieces, it is also clear the effort and the difficulty to reproduce coins which, unlike Greek and Roman coins, not only had no images printed, but were difficult to compare with any other existing coin. Legends are far from being clear, also sometimes for modern scholars, and the shape of the coins is often irregular. We have also to think that these exemplars have a diameter of about one centimeter, so they are very small pieces. Um, this, way, this is why documentary research is so important. Petot's images are not always reliable in details, in the position of the letters, in the interpretation of the legends. I show you some examples. If you see the S on the original Orléans coin, it is reproduced correctly in the, in the recto, but on the verse it is uh, represented as a normal letter and not horizontally. The coin on the right has very irregular edges and the, the, the draftsman and the engraver is struggling to give a regular edge, edge to the coin and try to, and also he tries to integrate the missing letters. So, and of course he arrives to a sort of Tagnocino Monnayer, which is a, a completely wrong reading of the, of the name of the Monnayer. If we go for further, this is a coin. These are all coins we are sure that belong to Petot. You see on the left, there is this coin again with very irregular edges. And you see the N on the original is backwards, but it is reproduced uh, normally on um, Petot image. And again, the position of the letters in the verso is very different from the one in the original. So it's very hard to, um, uh, to use only Petot's images to understand where the coins are. This is a mystery. On the right, we have uh, one of the very few coins we have found outside Paris. It's a coin who is said to be in Vienne. We have documents uh, which assure uh, us that the coin is in Vienne, 
But as you see, while the rector is reproduced more or less correctly, the position of the letters and of the cross in the verso is completely different from the original. So this is our difficulty to work with this kind of material. And this is for the Merovingian coins. When it comes to the Carolingian period, we find not only coins, but also images from manuscripts, like the one on the left, it's from an illuminated manuscript belonging to Peto, which is now lost, and also text, as you see on the right, and as we have seen from, for the letters of Suger. The right image shows two rows of Carolingian coins and the text which reproduces two articles from a document of the greatest importance for, for coinage, the Edict of Pitre, 864, by Charles de Bold, which was unpublished, unpublished at the time. Petot was able to make a copy of a now lost manuscript containing the Edict in Beauvais, as you see from Peto subs subscription at the top of the, <clears throat> of the page. The article and this manuscript is in the um, Vatican. Article 11 of the edict, of the edict uh, establishes, sorry, maybe it's not the, the, the um, I think the slide is not correct. We can do it with this, okay. Uh, I think there is a problem with this image, but okay. Um, the article 11 says that the new denarii shall have on one side our name in the circle and in the middle the monogram of our name. And on the other side, it is to have the name of the Civitas and in the middle, a cross. Now we can't see uh, from the, sorry, can I ask you for your help? Um, I think the image is going, has gone down. I don't know. Uh, yes, this one, for some reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. no, no, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, but believe me. <laughs> And also the following one, I don't know. Okay, no, believe me when I say that um, although on the manuscript there are no images, of course, um, Peto tries, or I think it is he who tries to make an image out of the text. So to illustrate the text with an imaginary coin, but a coin which, which resembles at the same time to the text and also to the other coin represented in his work. We must remember that uh, Peto is a jurist. So he tries with this manuscript to give a sort of docum documentary and legal basis to the publication of his coins. Okay, here we are. Now it's okay. Um, in his catalog of antiquities and coins, then, Peto includes what has been probably the most admired section of his collection, the manuscripts. But while Peto's antiquities remained mostly in France, the manuscripts were sold by his son, who continued to increase the collection. The manuscripts were sold to Queen Christina of Sweden and are now the main bulk of the Reginenses Latini in the Vatican Library. There are some manuscripts that the Queen didn't brought to Rome and now are in Stockholm, and what remained from the sale was, was dispersed. Although scattered all over Europe, manuscripts once belonging to Peto can be recognized quite easily through his bindings, and as we will see later, through his ex libris, as you see on the left, through his signature, as we have already seen, and as we see now, go further, 
through his Greek motto, which we find also in the frontispiece of the Porciuncula. And I apologize for, for the English translation, is just to have an idea of what the, the motto is about. And most important of all, in the top right corner of the place, the shelf mark, the original shelf mark of Petos uh, Library. The shelf mark is to be found in many manuscripts. It is made by a letter and a number. The number is the shelf. The letter refers to the volume. So each shelf has 26 volumes. I have to say that we have no inventory of Paul Petos library. We have the many inventories of the library at the time of his son, Alexandre. And one of those inventories is, has been printed by Bernard de Montfaucon. The aim of this section of the project is to try to trace all the manuscripts once belonging to Petot, to have a map of where they are now and have a general idea of their provenance and their content. We hope to go further and to be able to virtually reconstruct Peres uh, sorry, Petot's library shelf by shelf. At the present moment, we have been able to trace about 800 manuscripts with shelf mark. In a very general way, we can say that the lower number of the shelves of which we are sure is seven, the highest 59. So the number of the manuscripts should have been around 1,500. Don't ask me why we have no number from one to six. This is a mystery. <laughs> we will try to solve it maybe in the following months. Some of the shelves are almost complete. Like, just to make an, an example, shelf 48. B48, they are all from the Vatican Library, B48 contains the voyage, the imaginary voyage of Jean de Manville in the Holy Land. We jump for the moment to D48, which contains French poems about the Battle of Yelège and the Journal d'un bourgeois de Paris, an account of the political and religious events of the reigns of Charles VI and the VII. So they are all broadly uh, composition about uh, the history of the first half or uh, the first half of the 15th century. E48 contains Le Grand Chronique de France, a compilation of the history of the French kings completed in, 16, in 1461. One of the difficulties of the work will be to try to understand how Petot's library was organized. What were the connections between the volumes on the same shelves? And what were the connections between the shelf and shelf? And to do so, we will need the help of experts who have studied the manuscripts in depth. Luckily, today we have one of them, Rosa Maria Rodriguez Porto, who is a Ramon y Cajal Fellow at the University of Santiago de Compostela and adjunct associate professor at the Faculty of Humanities of the University of Southern Denmark. She has extensively worked on late medieval book illumination and on the classical tradition in the Middle Ages. And she will speak about the missing manuscript, C48 in Petot's library, which is now in Copenhagen. It is my pleasure then to give the floor to Rose. Uh, I would like to start by expressing my gratitude to Cristina Ruggiero and Elena Vajani, and of course to Professor Fistera for the invitation. Uh, it is a great pleasure and an honor to be part of this uh, launch event of, of the project. Uh, as you can see from my first slide and also from what uh, Elena said in her kind presentation, I will be uh, speaking about this uh, uh, manuscript uh, in Copenhagen. Sorry, there is a typo. There is a <laughs> uh, in, in Copenhagen, but well, this manuscript uh, uh, taught uh, 554 uh, folio on which I had worked for, for some time when I uh, uh, heard about uh, this new project on, on Petot's collection. So I will try to, well, uh, uh, share with you um, my findings uh, about this, this manuscript and actually not just about this manuscript, but also about other manuscript now in Stockholm, 
which also belong to Paul Petau, and that, uh, funny enough, preserve the same text. Both of them are copies of uh, Rodrigo Jiménez de Radas, The Rebus Hispania. It's a 13th century chronicle of the Iberian Peninsula from a supposedly uh, mythical uh, uh, prehistory until 1243. And because I had been working on uh, Iberian historiography, I uh, became acquainted with these two manuscripts. So uh, if it weren't for that, uh, I would have never encountered Paul Petot, I'm afraid, and I would not be able to, to be here with you today. So I'm very grateful that he had this interest in Iberian history. Uh, these manuscripts were uh, already identified as belonging to the library uh, or, uh, by Petot already in the 19th century, in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. But I guess that because uh, they were in Scandinavian libraries and they had been related to this sort of uh, uh, Iberian studies field, they had been, uh, they have been rather neglected uh, in the historiography uh, about Petro. In any case, it was Brun in his uh, catalog of the illuminated manuscripts in the Royal Library in Copenhagen, the first to uh, identify this book as, as belonging to Paul Petot. And this information was further uh, confirmed and expanded by Paul Hogeberg, who was uh, um, a Hispanist, a Swedish Hispanist, who produced these two very erudite catalogs of the Spanish manuscripts in uh, Copenhagen and in the Swedish uh, libraries. As you can see, these manuscripts are uh, regarded in these uh, two studies as Spanish manuscripts. So there is a sort of confusion here that started with Brun himself, who had uh, uh, considered uh, the manuscript in Copenhagen as a representative of the uh, Flemish Spanish style. It is not, as you may have noticed, both are French manuscripts. But I am I'm sure that because they were uh, identified as Spanish, they were completely forgotten. <laughs> but that's why I came, uh, uh, I came to know them. So there is a good side of it. Uh, the other uh, achievement uh, by Hogwer was to identify not just uh, uh, these two manuscripts as belonging to Paul Petot, but also uh, a funny, well, a, a striking feature uh, that they both share. And it is that they are not only copies of uh, Jimenez de Rada's chronicle, but they also include a second historiographical work, briefer, which is the uh, up to this point, unknown Cronica by Benito Morer de Torla, which is a sort of uh, uh, continuation of Jiménez de Rada's text. So he starts where the Bishop of Toledo ended in the times of uh, Ferdinand III of Castile, and he adds the biographies of the subsequent Castilian kings until Henry IV, so until his own times. And he dates his work in 1459, as one of the readers, perhaps Alexander Petot, has highlighted in, in the manuscript in Copenhagen. Uh, even more striking is the fact that there are only three copies of this otherwise obscure text. And the three of them are French. This was very puzzling for a uh, uh, the two editors of the text. And they already uh, uh, put forward the hypothesis that this text had already been uh, uh, conceived from the very beginning as a text for dissemination abroad, being a, a Latin text too. Uh, I will speak about the other copy, this copy uh, at the BNF at the end of my presentation. So far, uh, uh, Let's go back to, to the manuscript in, in Copenhagen. As you can see in uh, um, the very detailed catalog of the medieval Latin codices in the Royal Library of Copenhagen, again by Ellen Jorgensen, the manuscript is perfectly described. So 
Jorgensen noticed all the elements in the book that clearly confirm that this manuscript came from uh, Petos library. So in the spine, you can see Petos monogram. You can see his coat of arms and his uh, uh, Latin motto on the uh, book plate. You can also see his coat of arms again, painted in folio five. And you can also see the old, uh, the old shelf mark uh, Elena uh, already mentioned. So in this case, uh, uh, the evidence is uh, uh, plenty to, and, and, and confirms uh, without any trace of doubt that this uh, was part of his library. Uh, whereas in the case of the manuscript in uh, Stockholm, the evidence is more scant, but it's still significant. Uh, also, Elena um, showed some manuscripts that had the Greek motto, and you can see that uh, it reappears here. Uh, there is an old shelf mark in this uh, uh, manuscript, and I at first thought that may be uh, also related to uh, Petot's uh, library. But if you can, uh, if you can have a look at how it is written, it lacks the dots that usually are uh, in between the letter and the number. Um, the handwriting is completely different. And also, uh, thanks to uh, Elena, who has done this research for me, um, it doesn't seem so uh, um, tightly fit into uh, all the other books we know that have this uh, 29 number because these are legal texts. So in the case of uh, the manuscript in Copenhagen, it perfectly fitted with the other historiographical texts. In, and in this case, it is not uh, like that. So probably this was other shelf mark unrelated to Petro. Whatever the case may have been, the two manuscripts are also included in Montfaucon's uh, uh, printed uh, edition of the uh, catalog of the library of Alexandre Petot. And it's easy to identify each of them. Uh, and actually Jorgensen uh, had already noticed it. So one of the, uh, one of it is uh, uh, entitled Roderici Toletani Chronicon Gotorum Hispaniae. And if you remember, well, perhaps I can go back. Here we have Rodericus. Is, so it's more, more likely that this is uh, uh, referring to the volume now in Copenhagen. Whereas here, what we have is in French, Chronique d'Espagne, which fits with the other one that is listed as an anonymous work, Chronicon Hispaniarum. So Petot had two copies of the same text, but it seems that he was not aware of that. In any case, as I said, uh, well, the Greek motto is uh, uh, without any doubt in, uh, in Paul Petot's uh, hand. I'm more uncertain about other notes found in the manuscript in Copenhagen. I don't know because I have seen that there are differences between his cursive hand and, and when he writes rubric. So I don't know in any case, I hope that uh, future research and, and the, uh, uh, well, the examination of more manuscripts uh, with his handwriting may be able to uh, confirm or discard this, this attribution. How these two manuscripts ended in Copenhagen and Stockholm. We know that the one in Copenhagen once belonged to Count Otto Todt who was the greatest Danish bibliophile and who owned the, as well, it has been considered as the greatest private library in 18th century Europe. Uh, this library was uh, auctioned when he, he died and most of his early prints, well, not most, all of his early prints and manuscript ended in the Royal Library. And it was after his death that the library was catalogued. So it is known 
that uh, uh, there wasn't any sort of uh, uh, systematic arrangement of the library to the despair of the visitors who uh, had gone to, to Copenhagen to consult it when Todd was, uh, Todd was alive. So this shelf mark that the book still has is Todd 554 relates to the number assigned in this printed catalog. But the book has other shelf marks that are just pasted on uh, the cover. I haven't been able to identify the provenance of, of these uh, shelf marks. Uh, my suspicion or my initial suspicion was that this uh, uh, manuscript was part of this lot of books left behind in, in uh, uh, Sweden when uh, Queen Christina uh, uh, went to Rome. But that is uh, something that perhaps we, we have to take with some suspicion because Todd, uh, had, we know that Todd had agents all over Europe and that he was willing to pay whatever sum for getting uh, uh, some of his manuscripts. So, in fact, this could have been purchased anywhere. In the case of the manuscript in Stockholm, I think that the connection with this, this, this Swedish lot uh, of the books of Peto uh, may be clearer. In this case, uh, we find, uh, we encounter other um, famous Scandinavian bibliophile and, and book collector, Johann Gabriel Sparvenfeld, who was uh, a sort of polymath, uh, and he had a strong interest in uh, Spanish language, and not only Spanish language, he studied uh, all sorts of, of uh, different uh, linguistic families in Europe. But he was especially interested in Gothic history. So the Goths considered as the common ancestors of both Spaniards and Scandinavians. So actually he collected a lot of books related to Iberian history. So it makes sense that he uh, uh, may uh, have included this book in, in his library. Uh, as you can see, the. Uh, present shelf mark of the book is this D1263. It was also known as Sparvenfeld 10, because that again was the number assigned in the catalog produced after his death before his books were uh, bequeathed to the Royal Library. Well, part were to the Royal Library and, and uh, other part went uh, to uh, the university in Uppsala. In this case, I think that uh, other shelf mark we find in the book is fine. This number 17 may be the actual uh, uh, shelf mark from Sparvenfeld uh, collection. But again, it's impossible to go any farther than that. In any case, uh, uh, what I would like to perhaps uh, emphasize is that these uh, manuscripts from Petot's library in Scandinavia deserve uh, more attention than the one they have had. We know that in Copenhagen, there are at least other five books related to Petot, and in Stockholm, there are seven, so enough. Okay, so now I'm going to leave aside Petot for a while and to present uh, uh, what I have found out about the origins of this manuscript, which is interested in, in itself. So as you may have uh, suspected, the key, the clues for uh, uh, understanding where this manuscript was produced and for whom are the two other coat of arms that uh, uh, are included at the bottom of folio five. Uh, next to those, uh, next to that of, of Petot. After some intense archival work, I have been able to identify them as belonging to, on the one hand, Pierre Doriol, who was uh, first the mayor of La Rochelle, but most importantly, the chancellor of France between 1472 and 1483. 
and president of the Chambre des Comptes afterwards. He was one of the main figures in the time of uh, King uh, Louis XI, and he had a very, very uh, uh, important role in some of the key events of, of those uh, decades, such as uh, the trials of Louis of Luxembourg and Jacques d'Armagnac. And he was also the one uh, confiscating the books of Cardinal Ballou. So <laughs> he had a connection with books, perhaps not the most suspected one, but, but intense. The other coat of arms belonged to Thibault, Boy, uh, Thibault Bayet, who was also Councillor of the Parliament of Paris and had other crucial uh, uh, administrative roles uh, throughout his life. And, and as you can see here, uh, he died in 1525. So a long professional career also in this uh, sort of uh, legal uh, sphere, highly specialized uh, top uh, uh, royal uh, councillor. Also to give you a sense of the kind of cultural environment they belonged to, Thibault Bayet was the brother-in-law of Antoine Leviste, who was the patron, the supposed patron of the famous series of tapestries of the unicorn in the Musée Cluny de Paris. So we are talking about top uh, 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 civil servants, so to speak. And actually, there was a connection between both of them because both Doriol and Bayet were part of the, the jury in charge of uh, uh, assessing the, the guiltiness of Jacques d'Armagnac. So a very important role. And I assume that the book was a gift from Doriol to Bayet. But uh, well, if I was attracted to this manuscript to begin with, was because it's an illuminated manuscript. And actually, the analysis of the illumination can, can give us a clue to the place and the time when the manuscript was produced. So you can see, uh, well, this is the, the only illustration it has, but which is uh, uh, extraordinary in itself because, uh, well, it's the only known copy of the, uh, the Rebus Hispania that has an illustration. So the whole textual tradition of the text lacks proper uh, uh, illustration. But uh, I mean, the first time I look at it, I was completely baffled and I had no idea of where this may have come from. But actually, again, after a sort of systematic uh, uh, stylistic analysis, I think that we can, uh, surely uh, uh, put forward the hypothesis that it was illustrated by Robinette de Stade, who was a well-known uh, uh, artist from the area of Poitou, who had a very long career, first uh, uh, in, in uh, Poitiers and then in Cognac at the court of the Angoulême uh, family. Uh, I don't know if you have noticed, but there is even a sort of uh, uh, compositional similarity between two, the two images. We have a king in both cases. Uh, we have his court. We have this sort of uh, inner courtyard and a scene farther away in the, uh, in the horizon. Uh, Actually, uh, there was a detail. I was very puzzled when I saw the miniature uh, on the first, uh, well, uh, the first time, and it's this figure with the crouches. There isn't anything in the text that speaks about, I don't know, the king uh, giving alms to the poor or anything. Nothing. But we had, we find a similar scene on the uh, illustration. Uh, um, in the Grand Chronique de, de France. Uh, in one case, we have Ferdinand III, and the other we have Louis IX. They were cousins. I don't know if that was some sort of connection or inspiration for the start, but I think that he's using some sort of, uh, uh, well, the same visual uh, devices in, in both works. 
and that uh, for me is uh, uh, perhaps a clue that the manuscript was produced around the same dates. I mean, the, the manuscript in Copenhagen, then this uh, copy of the Grand Chronique uh, de France that has the date of 1471. So I think that uh, they are part of the early works of Robinette de Star, who has a very recognizable uh, style uh, characterized by this sort of uh, enamel-like uh, appearance of the figures, this flattening of the surface, things that will be uh, stressed uh, over the time and, and even more visible, more conspicuous in his later works. But I think that, well, despite the differences, there are some similarities in facial types and so on. Again, uh, uh, you can see here other examples. And that includes even the design of some of the illuminated letters that I think that it's uh, close enough to, to argue for uh, the common authorship. Uh, how Pierre Doriol uh, may have uh, heard about this uh, Cronica de Benito Morer de Torla? Well, I think that uh, there are details that uh, confirm this connection with the Iberian Peninsula. And one of them is that in 1461, he was sent by Louis XI to Castile, well, actually to Aragon, uh, in a very special political uh, juncture. So uh, in 1461, Carlos de Viana, the heir of the th uh, throne of Aragon, had died. Henry IV of Castile was chosen as the king, uh, the new king of Aragon, but he was hesitant, so he asked for Louis XI's verdict on that. And uh, Louis XI uh, 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 advised him not to take the crown of, of Aragon. And uh, uh, it seems that Doriol had a very prominent role in this uh, negotiation. And actually, further proof of his interest in Iberian history is that there are some autograph notes by him in which he presents a sort of uh, modern additions to Boccaccio's De Cassibus. So who are the most spectacular cases of fall, fall of princes that we can uh, know from our times? And he includes four examples from the Iberian Peninsula, from Castile and very recent ones. So first of all, uh, 14th century uh, uh, Peter I, but then Alvaro de Luna, uh, Marques de Villena, and even Carlos de Viana we saw uh, later. Okay, and I'm, these are my concluding remarks. I think that by now you may have already uh, realized that there is a connection between Petot and the original owner of the manuscript, Pierre Torriol. Both belong to this ecosystem of the French parliament. The Francorum Curia, as Petot himself uh, calls it in, in his uh, uh, work and, and he presents himself. I don't know if they imagine themselves as sort of new senators of modern France, but there is some sort of class awareness in all this. And I'm sure that the interest Petot had in the manuscript in Copenhagen had to do with his uh, 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 recognition of these coats of arms of Doriol and Bayet, and, and his uh, sense of belonging to the same uh, uh, sphere. And actually, if you remember how the coat of arms are displayed on the bottom of the page, there is a sort of emphasis on this sort of this idea of continuity. If you remember, there were other, there was other copy of the same text. And tracing its provenance back, I think that it belonged to the uh, family Seguier. And this is other famous family of members of the parliament, jurist, etc. So these texts only circulated in this very restricted uh, realm. So perhaps in order to understand better uh, Petot's interest, we should also pay attention not just to this sort of erudite network, but also this sort of class network he belonged to, which was that of the Parliament of Paris. So thank you very much. <laughs>